This is Henry Brand, the reigning world champion of the Pokemon trading card game. He's an Australian Pokemon trainer with a number of achievements under his belt, and I was fortunate enough to sit down with him and learn the inner workings of a pro player. It is one day out from regional, so Melbourne is starting tomorrow, day one, and I've been fortunate enough to meet up with this fellow. This fellow, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Henry Brand, I'm the current Pokemon trading card game world champion. I've got a few questions for you. Probably more about your psych and how you get prepared for a big tournament like tomorrow. Yeah. So you've got the experience, you've been to many regionals before, mm -hmm. and you've, uh, you've competed in Worlds, and I think you've done pretty well. And all right, yeah. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about uh, Worlds 2019 and the, and the lead up to it. Sure, so preparing for an event like Worlds is a lot different to other events. Um, it's similar to this Melbourne in the sense that it is a new format, uh, new cards have come out, but in Worlds, we actually lose a lot of cards. And so the similarity between the two is that you have to figure out what is good. Yep. And when you're approaching a brand new format, you have some general themes that you want to follow and you want to be playing a strong, consistent deck with its own inherent game plan. Rather than like focusing too much on countering things and worrying about that, yep. um, you more just want to be executing a baseline strategy yourself. Now, that's what I essentially did with, with Mewtwo and Mew Tag Team GX, is that um, me and the people I worked with, we identified a, a very consistent way to execute a consistent game plan with the deck. And with Melbourne coming up, you would be looking to do the same thing. Now, obviously, uh, it's a little bit easier since not all the decks change. We don't lose a bunch of cards to rotation, but you do want to follow the same principles. You don't really want to be playing something that relies too much on what other people are playing because you don't know what they are yet. The meta hasn't stabilized. You don't know card counts in decks. Um, the easiest example at the moment, uh, for those familiar with the current meta, would be Dialga decks that would play Diancie. Diancie blocks um, supporters affecting your bench Pokemon, so bosses orders. But you don't know if people are playing Cross Switcher. You don't know if people are playing um, Cancelling Cologne, and until these lists stabilize, you can't really play decks like that. Okay, so I'm a new player, and I've come into the scene as a player in the last four weeks. And a lot of what I'm doing is basically following a new player entering the scene mm -hmm. and trying to see how good you can get before entering a major tournament, because regionals in Melbourne is one of the major oceanic tournaments. Yeah. And it's been eye opening for me. I've just, you know, I came into it maybe a little bit naive, thinking that you could get to a level where you could compete with the pros, people like yourself. But I think I've very quickly learned by week one or two that the, the gap between someone who understands the current meta and someone who understands years of metas and years of cards, it's just, it's a chasm. And part of that is probably because you're able to adapt on the fly mm. and acclimate yourself pretty well in new situations. Sounds like Worlds is kind of the similar sort of setting for that. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is similar in a sense, like you said. Uh, it still is a brand new format, but the longer that you've been playing for, the more you've experienced the kind of patterns and trends that pop up in the game, different cards, whether they existed in the past or the present, and just in general, you get a greater understanding of the game allows for, as you said, more on the fly, more versatile um, kind of decision-making and also play uh, at the end of the day. And that is as a result of how, I guess, you do find these tournaments and that you find that newer players do need to put in a lot more effort and preparation than maybe those that are a little bit more veteran. We just mentioned a little bit talking about how experience plays a part in acclimating new situations and tournaments like Worlds. How long have you been playing? Uh, so I've been playing for nine years now, yep. on and off. And why'd you start? I mean, I really liked Pokemon when I was a little kid. Um, I liked the cards, learned to kind of read because of them, like it's kind of fun. I really wanted to know what they said, uh, but never played the game. Uh, but then when I was like 12 or 13, um, there was an EB Games in the city that ran Pokemon tournaments. Yeah. So I went there, I learned, I was like, yeah, I kind of like this. And then eventually, you know, got into some tournaments and played on and off for a while. But then, uh, yeah, eventually got into it properly competitive and here we are. Well, nine years is a long time. Yeah. And I sometimes think about other hobbies I have and how interested I remain in them for a period of time. I feel like in life we sort of shift interests. So what might interest us for a long period of time, a couple of years later, might be totally relevant to us. And we find new, new hobbies that we like. What keeps you going? That's a really interesting question because I think for a long time, like you said, uh, there wasn't really something. I think I kind of uh, went, you know, back and forth between it. I would come, I would go. Played very a lot in 2014 when I was um, in seniors, the kids division. Um, loved it a lot. Took a break afterwards. Would play maybe you know nationals each year in Australia when we used to have those. Uh, but then fast forward to about 2019. Um, we had the Oceanic International Championships in Melbourne yep. for the first time and a bunch of friends that I knew from Pokemon were like, you've got to come play, like, come, come play, like, this will be awesome, like, you know, you've got to come. So I went um, and I, I played and there were about 400 people and I came top eight and I was like, cool, this is a sick result, like, awesome, play the next one. So I yep. went to the regional championships following it about a month later and I won that and then it kind of just snowballed from there that, well, I'm, I'm doing well in these, may as well keep going and see where it takes. It clicked with you very early on, yeah? Why do you think that is? When I was even younger, before starting Pokemon, um, I played a lot of chess tournaments, so I think right. similar kind of 
structure of tournaments, but also strategy and competitive nature of things was already there. Yeah. Um, and I was very interested in it when I was you know, like a teenager. I really liked the deck building uh, aspect because it's kind of like you get a problem and you have to f solve it and you have to find a solution. It can be abstract, it can be straightforward, and there's kind of a lot of ways you can approach each situation. And ultimately that combined with the whole competitive nature and like the adrenaline rush you get from a tournament is, I guess, what keeps you there, yeah. That's something that I've found very early on. and. I was speaking to another player, Hot Chalk PTCG. I'm not oh, sure yeah. you heard of him. Shay. Yeah, Shay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. One thing I was saying to him is, as an observer for such a long time of the play community, one thing I noticed at the end of last year was when Mu VMAX became very relevant, there was a lot of pushback on it from a lot of players. Maybe distaste from experienced players because it felt like such a auto-win deck. So I sort of came into the game this year with this preconception that Mu was just overpowered. Mm. I didn't really understand why. But the more I played the game, the more I learned that while Mu VMAX is a really strong deck, it's not invincible. Mm. And playing against that deck really brought out the problem-solving aspect of the game, mm. which I think is lost on a lot of people. My experience, again, with it is that it's probably brought out more of me as a player because I've had to learn how to adapt to it. Mm. Do you think that it's caused or, or force the, the, the scene to adapt to it and come up with new ideas to tackle it? Yeah, I think it has. And it's created what we call a centralized metagame. And so there is one deck that is overwhelmingly strong uh, and it is considered the best deck in format in a literal sense of how its power level is so much higher than everything else. But it becomes not the best deck to play for a tournament despite that simply because of how big of a target it has on its back. And so it creates an interesting kind of meta where you have every deck trying to beat this and then as a result, no one can really play it that much and then the decks play against each other and then so you could choose well for this tournament i won't count them you and then if people call your bluff on that then they play it then you can so it, it kind of goes back and forth like that i think that mu in itself um at certain points has been a little bit too strong i think that right now um it's kept in check a little bit by roxanne and path i think that's a nice splashable way that decks can deal with it but it kind of just got one too many tools with brilliant stars it felt like it had kind of everything and i think the issue that people have with the deck is not so much i guess it in general but it's more the problems that it it does no one's really claiming that it doesn't take any skill or anything but that there are a lot of situations that the deck can present where you don't actually have to play it optimally in order to have the optimal effect of the deck if you draw well yeah. enough it is functionally identical it puts on so much pressure that if you were to draw suboptimally against it, you basically can't win, which forces you to sh like stranglehold your deck into consistency. And basically an issue I had when I was building Arceus decks at the beginning of last format was that in order to beat Mew, you would have to essentially front load your deck with consistency so that you set up perfectly at the beginning of the game. But as a result, your strength throughout the rest of the game would be extremely low because you either have, wouldn't have deck space for the cut power cards you need, or you would basically just not have an engine to see you through the rest of the game. And yep. so whilst you would be better against Mew, you then couldn't beat anything else. Uh, and so that's the kind of problems it would create in terms of deck building and the, the stress. And eventually you basically just have to settle. If I open weak against Mew, I lose. And you have to accept that. And that's, I think, where the problems arise. Part of the reason why I wanted to interview you today is because I did want to pick your brain a little bit as a pro player. I'm coming into my first regionals and I'm trying to get as much information as I can. And I've been very fortunate that people like yourself Justin here on the team at Kraken, um, Jose in the Melbourne scene, just so many players that have shared their knowledge mm. and openly discussed strategies as you just have. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that's such a common thing in the Pokemon card community? I mean, that's a really good question. I know that when I was younger, I mean, even nowadays, it's hard to get me to shut up about Pokemon, <laughs> let alone um, talk about it. And I think it's just because it's something that you find interesting. And if you find something interesting, you kind of want to talk about it no matter what. And I think that that's um, a common theme throughout all the players in Melbourne. Um, and just in general, I think people like to talk about Pokemon. And I think if you ask someone a question, they're probably going to answer it more often than not. You know what I mean? Like there's obviously certain circumstances where someone might be having a deck for regionals that they don't want getting out. But other than that, most people are pretty down to talk theory and, and things like that. And I think just yeah, the desire to talk about it is why. Well, if you want to talk theory a little bit more, sure. you touched on a topic before about how Mu VMAX has created a centralized meta. One thing I found difficult as a new player is thinking a little bit too much about um, how to prepare for it. I feel like a lot of players are going to play Mu VMAX, and then the second deck they'll probably play is Palkia v Star. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if a lot of people are going to play that deck or those decks, I should play something that can counter those decks. But then that line of thinking got me onto another point where I'm thinking, okay, wait, if I'm thinking that I should counter it, well, then there's going to be some someone else that is probably going to counter it. And I very quickly found myself in this meta rabbit hole yeah. where I'm totally overthinking what I'm going to do. How do you deal, <laughs> I guess, with the feeling of preparing your deck for regionals because 
you know, we have to submit our decks tonight mm -hmm. about, I think, six or seven hours. Mm. So you need to make a decision. Yeah. How do you come to that decision? I mean, I think it depends vastly on how, I don't know if this is the right word, but seriously, I'm taking a tournament in a sense in that how in depth I'm going with my preparation. So if I'm really going hard, then I would have been spending you know, multiple weeks and essentially trying to do, like you said, find a deck that essentially beats everything or as much as I can. Whilst maintaining consistency, of course, and deciding that it's a good play now, that takes a long time because when you're trying to do something like that, you're relying often on quite intricate game plans and you need it to be perfect. If it isn't proven to be good and isn't baseline powerful like Palkia or like Mew, you have to be very confident in it. And so to try and establish kind of perfect matchups is very difficult. It's much easier to go with a baseline powerful deck and then play better than your opponent in seven of your eight rounds and get lucky in the eighth or something, you know what I mean? Like that's typically the best way to play it. You have the baseline power level of cards on your side. And like you said, it's much better to um, play a deck perfectly, even if it's a bit weaker of a deck or a wrong choice than it is to pick the right choice and not play it well. I came to the decision based on that, that rationale that a lot of other players have said to me and I'm sticking with, um, with Palkia V-Star now. It's been interesting because I feel like I can drive my deck well mm -hmm. and I'll bring it to a new tournament. I brought it recently to Wednesday night here at Kraken and it'll perform well and then it will perform terribly. I'm 50-50 on cards like Cross Switcher in the mm -hmm. Palkia V-Star deck. It's like a spicy card, mm. you know, it gives you a bit of opportunity, but its presence doesn't really feel heard for me until late game. So I cut it tonight. How do you feel about cards like that? With cards like that, and just in general, with any card in your deck, you want it to be serving a very specific purpose. So you don't want to be playing cross switcher because it's sometimes nice, or it does this, like you want a very specific cut and dry reason for why. You want it to be because you want to combo with the supporter. Like you want to play Roxanne plus cross switcher. You want to play Melanie plus cross switcher. You want to use a heavier reader engine. So you might play four rereader, and as a result, you want to play cross switcher so that you have more reach with it. You might want to play extensive combos like cross switcher and cancelling cologne, in which you would play uh, like more shade and dealings Intellion, and then you can go e reader for the Intellion and one of the three items, search for the last two, three card combo really easily. So you want to be doing specific things with the cards rather than them just having a general purpose a lot of the time. And in their specific use may just be that they're more consistent than something else, and that's okay. But there needs to be a specific and niche reason for why you're ever playing cards in a deck. Again, as a new player, I didn't fully understand the game and the, the history of cards and what each card in current standard regulation did. The first step I took was look at deck lists, right? Now, Palkia V-Star has been standard regulation in Japan for a couple months now. So I looked at a lot of Japanese deck lists, mm. and I grabbed one and I built it. I very quickly learned that <laughs> for the reasons that you said that, yes, there's a lot of um, net lists out there and there's a lot of information on the internet, but whether it's actually applicable to your play style and whether it actually has a presence in the deck mm. isn't necessarily true. So how do you feel about deck lists that you see out there online and play style in Pokemon? Because mm. there's a term that, that gets used a lot, which is piloting a deck but piloting a deck is a little bit different to driving it, if that makes sense. Driving yeah, it sort yeah. of has feel. Do you, do, you, yeah. do you agree with that? No, I think there's no such thing as play style in Pokemon. Right, um, okay. I think in every single turn, you have a correct and incorrect action, and it boils down very much to that. The only essence of play style would rather be in the uh, types of decks that you like to play. Okay. Um, in the sense of like, I prefer to play very aggressive decks, I prefer, prefer to play healing decks or control decks or things like mid-range. Things like that. That's absolutely boils down to play style. But in terms of how you make your decisions within the game, there's no play style based decision. This will always stick in my memory. Um, in the finals of Worlds, um, the commentators um, were talking, and one was um, Karl Sukovic, the other, um, Cora Georgia. She said, Does uh, Henry strike you as a particularly aggressive player? And Kyle says, I think Henry will make the right decision, or something along those lines. And I think it's showing his experience in the game as he's been playing since 2000 almost, and he was one of the most successful um, Pokemon players until he ended up working for Pokemon. But essentially that there is a correct and an incorrect answer, and that playstyle in terms of aggression or passive-based things are essentially not, um, not present. They may not always be visible. You may you know, choose to take the safe or the risky route, but at the end of the day, um, it will boil down that one is more statistically correct than the other. That's very interesting. I read an article that uh, Stefan Ivanov wrote at the end of last year that spoke about luck and probability in the Pokemon training card game. And his, you know, his emphasis through that whole essay was that there is no such thing as luck. There is a small element, but most of it is probability based. I'm not trying to play devil's advocate here yeah. and, and twist you into a question where you don't have an answer, but sure. I guess how do you juggle the decision making in the game in the middle of a game mm -hmm. when 
maybe things aren't going your way. Um, the hand that you have isn't ideal and you do need to lean in a little bit into rolling the dice per se. So you basically have to assess your chance of winning uh, in a particular situation. You might have this play where you could I don't know, play re Professor's Research, draw seven cards, and if you hit exactly five cards, you're golden. But it comes at a cost, right? So you have to be able to recognize, all right, if I don't hit that play, can I win it all? Now, this is more commonly actually um, occurring when you play for your opponent to miss something, right? So you say, it's very unlikely that they miss, but if they don't, then I can't win anyway. And so what you do is you take a risky play when you realize, well, if this doesn't work, I'm gonna lose anyway. And just accepting that if you take the safe play, you're gonna lose more gracefully, I guess. Right. You don't wanna lose gracefully. You, want, like, you, you kinda wanna lose hard of yeah, in this yeah, game. You yeah. wanna get murdered, right? Yeah. Like, you wanna play with a very small chance that you don't. But if you don't play for that, then you're not gonna win in the end. And having the foresight, and I guess the ability to see that far ahead in the game is what lets you, I guess, decide these probability-based situations. Yeah, okay. You grow up watching TV shows like Yu-Gi-Oh, mm. and there's a common term from that, you know, the heart of the cards. Mm. But in Pokemon, it doesn't really exist. And I found that pretty quickly. I've had games where I'll roll the dice, and I'll just, you know, professors research really early in the game because things don't look right, mm. and it doesn't pay off. And upon reflection of those games, I realized, you know, I got a bit um, lazy, mm. and I tried to gamble i guess my way into a win and it's just it's just not how it works in pokemon have you ever had an instance or a game where you've had to do that and it's paid off for you i guess That's a really good question though i think yeah, yeah like i guess i'm sure you have but like mm. i'm thinking like a pivotal like yeah, damn yeah. i'm glad that paid I off think, um <laughs> i mean not really because you you go for those plays and you accept that this is correct and regardless of the outcome it shouldn't matter because you made the right decision yeah like so if you make a play for a 53% chance versus 50% chance, and the 50% chance happens, well, you made the right decision. You have to, it's, it's like in poker, you have to accept those things, right? In terms of a specific one for me, um, I can't think of, of one that's that. That's all right. That specific, yeah. but it's, it's just essentially that, yeah. I guess that's probably the natural answer because you have spoken at length about decision-making. Mm. I think it's only natural that there has not been an instance where you've had to rely on luck. Your decision-making is kind of what's gotten you to your wins, I'd, I'd say anyways. It's just kind of how the luck portrays itself is that you go for these plays and they hit or they don't, right? And it's, you still make the right decision either way, but when it hits, it feels great. And if it doesn't, you kind of forget about it because I mean, like it, it didn't really matter at the end of the day. Like, it, yeah, it's not a significant You probably go winch to your friends about it for a, the round after, but uh, after that, it's yeah. move on, yeah. How do you approach game day, like getting there? Because this is probably the one thing that I just haven't been able to experience in any sense because I haven't done it yet. How do you deal with the day of regionals? Because it is pretty, I think it's pretty tight. I was gonna say stressful, but that depends on the person, but it's very compressed. Mm. You know, you got eight rounds, if you got 50 minutes per game, 53, and maybe a five, 10 minute break, depending on how long your game goes. Mm. How do you deal with it? I mean, it's exhausting, right? Yeah. But you kind of get used to it eventually. You have little coping strategies throughout the day, like, you know, taking a minute to yourself or, going for a walk or grabbing some water, like little things like that. Um, when it comes to actually managing the stress though, it's, it's very interesting, you said it's your first tournament. I think you wouldn't have experienced a very strange phenomenon, which is when you are, let's say you have to go 6-1-1, six, one, one. six wins, one loss, one tie, to make top eight. You lose your second round, your 1-1. One, one. You cannot lose again. Yeah. You can't. Your back is against the wall. Yeah, yeah. you have to win every single round for the rest of the day and it creates this weird, exciting, but terrifying kind of feeling where you can't lose. Yeah. Um, but as a result, you just need to kind of accept every single game is the same, right? So you say, all right, I just have to win this round. It doesn't matter what your overall score is because you want to go and in, win in and win the round anyway. It's your goal. So yeah, you just kind of win one game at a time and keeping everything in a micro scale rather than a macro is important and not letting it get away from you. We've seen pro players, uh, I guess since players returned, not perform as well as they'd like. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot, but I've seen players that, you know, have achieve massive things, not play well. Mm. And I don't, I don't think, I don't look at that and say, oh, they've fallen off or, you know, they're not as skilled. Sometimes that just happens. Mm. Has that happened to you before? Yeah, I mean, I think that the return from the pandemic um, hasn't been spectacular for me. It's been fine. Um, I actually, my, I came 17th at Brisbane Regionals, which for me was the worst I'd ever performed at a Regionals. Um, I think my previous worst was ninth, and that was a big, I don't know about it hits the right word, but it was almost a relief in a way for me because I was holding myself to such a, a standard in the past of, of that I had been in top eight of every regional for however long at the time, and it was kind of unreasonable um, to kind of keep that on you because it's, it's 
a card game. Either A, the cards might not go your way, you might be tired, you might not have the best day, you might not play your best. It happens. Yep. And I think just keeping those kind of standards is, is a lot. Um, now, I, uh, okay, I came top eight at Perth, so it's been okay. It's been a fine return to tournaments, but I think in terms of other players, it's also wise to acknowledge that there has been a general increase in skill across the community over the pandemic, okay. um, specifically, because through the online era, online tournaments and everything, not only has there been more chance for people to play, it's also been a way higher increase amount of information. So the information age of Pokemon is essentially hyper-modernizing the game in which top level um, uh, information, deck lists and everything is readily accessible to everyone. Now, in the past, if you were very good at building a deck, you're gonna rock up to Melbourne Regionals, the first tournament of the format with something that is so severely outclassed by someone who can. But nowadays, you can go online and find 700 different Palkia deck lists that are gonna be maybe 95% as efficient as um, a top player's power kill list. And so yeah. these kind of little ups that you have begins to le level the playing field a little bit more and I think is one of the reasons why we're seeing some top players not always have as consistent results because with Pokemon, you basically just have a margin up on your opponent. If you're better than your opponent, you have a slightly higher percentage of them to win. But the better than your opponents get, even if you're still above them, the slightly lower this margin gets and over a longer period, your results are going to diminish. Yeah. So just a statistical fact. On a personal level, and you don't have to feel pressure to answer this, but mm. where, do you, where do you set your expectations for yourself? I think a long time ago, I, I did mostly accept that it is a card game. So we talked a lot about mitigating probabilities and everything that there always is a right decision. There is, but just because you make it doesn't mean you're gonna win. Yep. Uh, now, I tend to say this to people, I get asked, did I think that I would win the world championships? And I think the answer is more, I genuinely didn't have doubt that I couldn't, but I, you can't have that level of confidence that you will. Right. I never thought that I didn't have the, I guess, the skill or the, the determination or whatever to achieve that, but you need to have a good day. Um, you need to have made the right deck call. You need to obviously have a bit of luck on your side. Like there are definitely games where obviously I had like fantastic draws. You will never hear someone win a tournament and say, man, I dead drew every single game. Yeah. Like it just doesn't happen. No, exactly. Um, and so as a result, like, I mean, I of course hold myself to the standard that, you know, I should, I feel like I should do well at, at every tournament, but if I don't and it's because I made a mistake, then that's on me and I gotta get better. And if, it, if I didn't make a mistake, then I shouldn't really be upset yeah. because it's out of my control. So logically and rationally, you can't really be too distraught at the result of anything because you either look, at, look to it as improvement or you look at it as like out of your control, but it doesn't quite work like that. Obviously, the day, it's not that simple. Yeah. Um, but I think just going through the kind of rational thought process is how I, kind of deal with that. There's a lot of talk about probability, statistics, and logic in mm. Pokemon. Do you feel like the game lacks emotion? Because it's quite competitive and competitive sports are emotion fueled, mm. depending on how angry or aggressive or passive a player is in sport, they might not perform as well or they might perform better. In Pokemon, it kind of sounds like taking the emotion out of it helps you perform better. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. Um, Obviously, I mean, maybe it's a little bit of a, a lifeless <laughs> way to look at it. But um, you, uh, like you were saying, you know, being making aggressive decisions or whatever. Now, there will always be a correct and incorrect decision, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to get rewarded for making the incorrect decision on occasions. And so you could, like you said, make very rash or risky decisions and, and not be punished. And it may readily appear that you played well or whatever, or, or you would win. But in the long run, that's not going to last as we've been talking about, like statistically speaking, it just cannot yep. continue. And so obviously, you know, making the correct um, statistical decisions are like that, but at the same time, if you are feeling particularly emotional and, you know, for whatever reason you think the gods are on your side, you can go for it and sometimes it's gonna work. Like it's yeah. not always, I guess that cut and dry, but yeah. The reason why I kind of asked that is because I mentioned to um, someone else who's been helping me, Jake Gearhart, hmm. an American player, that I feel better when I have a fourth Palkia V in my deck. And Jake's response to that was that there is no real, and I don't want to like make him sound harsh, but essentially that like what you feel doesn't really matter when you stack it against the stats. I'm paraphrasing him, yeah. but his reasoning for that was that statistically, decks perform better mm -hmm. when they have three Palkia V instead of four. I, try to believe pro players, I do, because mm. you guys got the experience, so I'll trust your, your judgment. But despite that, my brain is struggling to connect the dot and accept it, mm. because it feels better when there's a four, and the thought of putting only three, running three Palkia V, three Palkia V star, mm. feels wrong. How do you 
address that? Um, I mean, you just have to be confident in the maths, right? Now, I don't particularly agree on this power QA start point because I think at the end of the day, there are more nuances to everything than just the maths. So obviously there's a lot of factors to consider. So on the, this particular note, I haven't put an egregious amount of thought into it, but basically with Palkia, there's a lot of different functions. If you replace that slot with two via battle VIP pass, sure, it allows you to set up earlier, but those cards are completely useless later in the game. Now, the fourth Palkia V star is an additional bench sitter at every point. It's also an additional Palkia, which can support you in certain situations and just generally helps. And it actually increases your margins by having the fourth Palkia to open it, which increases the odds of having Palkia in your starting hand. Now it does give you a worse starter against Mew, which is the argument for not playing it, but you kind of have to go, you kind of have to accept that. And in a best of three, you can play for these margins. So in a best of three setting, you can say, cool, well, if it happens once, that's fine. Statistically, it won't happen again, and that's okay. But you need to have multiple lenses through which to examine the data. You can't just be looking at one specific angle. It is fairly holistic in the sense that um, basically you have to have everything, have a reason, but not be missing any at the same time. And so focusing too much on just numbers can be problematic at times. Yeah, okay. I think you really hit the nail on the head that you do need to look at it holistically because in isolation, a lot of these things can make sense. The game is logical. Each deck generally has a path, but the more that you focus on that, I feel, I feel personally, when I focus on that, I sort of start to lose touch with my deck. Mm. So while there isn't necessarily a feel or emotion, there's a disconnect in how I understand my deck. At what point do you feel like you understand a new deck? Um, I think given the experience that I have, um, and I've done this before, I would feel pretty confident in most situations almost playing a deck blind, okay. um, going into an event. I think that it always is a little bit risky, but if it is the right play, I have enough confidence that I can at least, you know, understand it leading into the event and then pick up the nuances on the fly or identify them as I go and not need to, I guess, figure out these game plans um, or be able to recognize them. Whereas a lot of the time, if you're a newer player or even a more advanced one, you need to play these matchups to learn the theory and to learn what you should be doing that isn't always readily obvious or that you take a few games to understand. The more you've been playing, the more you can recognize the situations without having to do that process and it does lend itself a little bit of an advantage. Typically, um, I would like to you know, play 50 games of the deck or something um, to understand something like five to 10 games of each matchup. Um, but also I think it's really important to simulate situations. So not just play the games, but also say, okay, well, my opponent drew kind of bad here. What if this had happened? And then set up that situation and then you go, Cool. I lose to that game plan and then you go, okay, how likely is that for that actually to happen? And so you assess how likely it is for your opponent to get that game plan and then yeah, essentially go from there and make your decision whether you need to account for it or not, or you need to know about it and things like that. So you can have preparation, you cannot depending on your experience level, but obviously it's always going to benefit you to actually understand the matchup theory. That is an extremely detailed and comprehensive answer to the question. And it's a testament to the kind of player and the, cal the caliber of player that you are. So knowing that, I, I look at that, I'm like, okay, let's say round one tomorrow I end up yeah. against Henry. What do you feel a new player can achieve at a regional, given that the gap between a player like yourself is just, it's a chasm, you know? <laughs> but the, the, the difference between you and me, I understand how to play my deck well, but you understand how to play your deck almost perfectly, arguably perfectly, as well as most, almost every other deck. I think it really, I mean, as you said, I think that there obviously is a general disadvantage um, to the newer player. But uh, given when we're talking a lot about probabilities, uh, you're never at 100% either side. There always will be margins for each player yep. and they essentially need to not so much play towards them, but yeah, I guess identify that. And with Pokemon as well, it's almost um, asymptotic in the sense that you could have uh, a player that is a five, right? And the difference between uh, like a five and a six might like in the um, percentage of who's going to win yep. might be the same as between a six and a nine and that the better the players get the less the skill actually matters because you get more and more close to perfect gameplay that probabilities matter more yep. and so for an absolute beginner then obviously you might miss some some things and the chances might not be that good for you but you're able to actually simulate a lot of this knowledge quite quite quickly by just practicing a one ma or the, your matchups over and over, understanding these theories or having someone walk you through it, you don't need to have the experience and I guess Pokemon specific problem solving skills that your opponents might have. Yeah. If you already know these game plans and you've learned them prior. And then I would honestly put you at no worse than like a 10% deficit yeah. because it would only put you at a disadvantage in situations that you are not prepared for. And then obviously your opponent and their experience may navigate the situations better. I guess it gives me a little bit of hope that you said that because 
That's kind of what I thought when I started this. Yeah. So I don't want that answer to give me, you know, no. blind confidence, but <laughs> it it kind of feels good to hear you say that. Yeah, I mean, it, like it's kind of like in chess where if you like know the moves for an opening, right? That, let's say twenty moves in, and you only play the first twenty moves of that opening versus that opening, then you're gonna play perfectly because you've seen it a hundred times. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter how good your opponent is if you're just playing that specific sequence and you know the sequence. And so you can simulate this skill that is built up over a long time, and it won't might not last if you just focus on these matchup skills. But in terms of getting very good very quickly, it is fairly possible to speed run um, yeah. these kind of things in that sense. Something that I very quickly learned was like it infinitely useful resource was playtesting with a group of people and mm -hmm. I guess the same group of people. It also fosters like a real amazing breeding ground for ideas mm. and strategies. You know, you're a renowned player. You don't want to reveal all your strategies to mm. other pro players. If you don't want me to put this in the video, <laughs> That's I won't. Yeah. How do you balance the line between creating an environment where ideas can flourish by sharing ideas, but also not revealing too much of your hand because, you know, you could potentially end up at Worlds again, competing on the final day. Yeah, I mean, it depends. Um, most of my preparation is often done just in theory. Um, so if I'm trying to build the deck or a lot of that, traditionally I'll try and do it in theory. I'll, I'll start by getting an understanding of the formats of the new decks that have come in and how they interact with each other, the strengths and weaknesses of each deck. For example, you might think like, oh, well, if, you know, Palkia does X, Y, Z, then on turn three, it's susceptible to this and like that kind of identifying weaknesses. And then basically you have an idea of saying, okay, I think I can beat this by doing this. Let me test it, test that exact scenario. See if it works, doesn't work back to the drawing board. If it works, cool. I typically have a very limited um, group of people that I specifically talk to, actually just like one or two. Um, and then for a tournament, it can change. If I have a really good deck that I've been working on and I'm confident with, sounds good, probably don't need that much help. If I um, don't and I haven't been you know, putting as much effort in, I might want to work with a larger group of friends and be like, all right guys, do you guys want to work together for this event? Be like, sounds good, fantastic. Once that's established, any ideas that I have, I'll share. Um, but it just kind of depends on the tournament specifically and going from there. Before you mentioned the information age and how it just hyper accelerates how people build lists and discuss Pokemon and strategize it, you're a bit of a personality online in that you know, you've know you won a world. So people kind of listen to what you say, almost a sense of just, oh, if Henry says it, it must be true. A couple of days ago or even yesterday, you put a tweet out and you tier listed the decks for upcoming regionals. How much do you think that plays into opponents' psych when they see it? Um, I'm not trying to demonize no, that. No, 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 I know. I'm very cautious of that because I, at least when I began, I was very public with information when I started playing. I was you know, like, I'd tell everyone anything if I had a deck idea. It doesn't matter, right? But nowadays, obviously, I have to treat it a little bit differently. Uh, but I still try and maintain the same level of transparency yeah. um, regardless. Now, if I have secret deck, I'm not going to post it, all right? But if I post the tier list, it's going to be my genuine thoughts, um, no matter what. And yep. So I'm not going to do anything of a mission or anything. It's just like some people said, you know, I left this and this off. I just picked the random tier list maker and said what they, they had. I didn't bother importing pictures in. Like, I just thought, oh, this sounds fun to do for, for two minutes. And so yep. I did that. And it's very interesting because people can only go one or two ways. They want to listen to you or they want you to be wrong. Right. Um, and it's very specific in, in both both ways and so you get um, a lot of both. And at the end of the day, I just people should be in the middle. People shouldn't be blind listening to me. Yeah. Um, no matter what, because you're not gonna improve as a result of that, you're right? Like you're, you need to do that yourself. You need to practice. You need to understand like why these things are happening and not just rely on other people, but also accept what they're saying as well. So if they say something, don't dismiss it. Think about it like logically and rationally and then um, critically and try it out yourself and then see if you agree. And if not, ask questions, but don't like dismiss or as yep. a result. And when you're testing as well, that's what I was actually going to say earlier is that you have to test open-handed. Like if you're playing with your friends or your group or whatever, it has to be open-handed and you have to be collaborating because A, you need to know how both decks function, but B, you need to be making sure absolutely that both board states, if you are testing decks specifically, uh, and both sides of the game are being played as perfectly as possible. Right. And so I actually, well, a lot of this will just test against myself or we'll have open hand testing at all points because it has to happen. Like you ha if you're just testing matchups, it has to be played perfectly because you don't want to come up with an idea, get into a tournament, play against the top player, and then they find an exploit in your strategy and you're like, damn, I wish I thought of that. Can't do that because it might feel good in the moment, but it doesn't actually 
obviously help at all. And it also helps both players to actually improve by looking at open hands and yeah, trying yeah. to figure out what to do from there. And that's probably the best way yeah. to go about it, yeah. You've qualified for Worlds already. Mm -hmm. you, do you automatically qualify for winning the previous Worlds? You do. Yeah. Um, you get a free trip, but you don't get a day two qualification. Okay, so you still got to work for that. Uh, yeah, I think I'm locked now, though. But I you have enough yeah. points, yeah. I guess you don't really need to take an event like tomorrow really seriously, do you? I would argue the opposite. I okay. think that... Um, I actually, I, I haven't taken this event as seriously as other ones in the past. Um, I haven't put enough, as much time into it. But I think that when you reach this point, and if you have high achievements, you do that through, the only way you can achieve anything is through a competitive drive, essentially, right? So you have to have ambition and you have to, to want to work hard. And I think once you do that and you accomplish it, it shouldn't just peter out. Also, you know, you have an element of pride, like you want to continue to do well. And I think that for me, at least, if I play, I don't really want to not take it seriously. Even if I haven't put as much preparation to this event as I have as other ones, I don't want to go in and accept a bad result immediately. Um, so I'm going to go in and obviously do my best no matter what. So I was going to ask you if you, can, if you think you can go back to back, but I'm probably going to upload this video before the event. You don't have to answer that question. Back to back in Melbourne. As in like back to back at Worlds. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> you reckon you can do it? I mean, it's like what I said earlier, right? I don't think there's anything meaning that I can't. Yeah. But there's absolutely no guarantees that I will. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a level-headed response. You are very composed and um, you're not cocky. You're not naive. You're very pragmatic, I'd say. How do you think you got to that point? Do you reckon it's, some, it's, it's been how you are since, since birth or that you've grown into this kind of player? Um, I'm not sure. I think I had a, long, a lot of experience with like, these kind of things in games like this and competition it's just kind of something that you inevitably get to i guess and if you try and take the emotion it's part of the whole probability and right decision i guess right you can look at things in a very rational sense but i don't think it's it's hard to say whether it's always been there or whether it's been a more recent development i guess have certain tournaments and regionals shaped you or changed you drastically yeah i mean obviously worlds did um so the first I see that I top eight were the only one actually, but the I see that I top eight it was massive because it was a really big result. It was the first time an Australian had top eighted our own IC, um, and then kind of spurred me on to keep going. And actually, what was really big about that was that uh, I was kind of known in, in the Australian scene for a while. Like I was had been played and made some top eights, and you know it was pretty reasonably up there. But internationally. No idea. And so what happened at this IC was that a bunch of American players came over. At the time, the very top players like Azul, um, Danny Altavilla, um, similar people like that. Very high profile at the time um, under the team DDG, I think they were called. And basically um, what would happen was that I basically beat them one after another, round after round. And I had a slightly favorable matchup, but what I played against one of them. And then immediately they were like, why you, like they said, why are you already playing around our deck? like what they were trying to do. Because I, like I saw that they had a Coco GX or something, so I just didn't attach an extra energy. It's one of those things where in the moment, given that I hadn't played that much and hadn't had that much exposure, it just seemed kind of normal. But then to have your opponents comment on it and being like, oh, this random Australian guy that's beating all of us is actually kind of okay. Yeah. And it kind of just happened like that. And then, you know, I just kind of knew a couple of people from there and actually did kind of get a bit of a recognition amongst some people like obviously some of them were too pleased to have lost to a random Australian and you just hear that going around and around like it was very funny yeah um to, to hear that and then they asked like a couple of Australians who's this guy's video and like oh that's Henry and it's like kind of nice to have that that moment and I guess from there on I was like yeah you know maybe I can do this yeah yeah beat all the established top players and it's like there's no reason that I can't yeah. Keep, keep doing well so it's funny to hear you tell that story because I actually heard the other side of it I caught up with Rahul Reddy yeah. Yeah. Last oh, earlier in the week, and he mentioned a story about you know when the Australians came, they came and they blew um, everyone's decks out of the water because they came with this new tech that like they just hadn't thought of. But it's just funny to hear you be like, oh, for me it was just natural to play around <laughs> it. Again, it's a testament to mm -hmm. to your skill level that on the fly you can when presented with new situations, you can still approach the game with that level of logic and composure. And I think that is also as we've been talking about a, um, an advantage to the experience that you can recognize these situations and not rely on this um, preordained mashup knowledge, I guess, to, to make your way through these situations. And get you through, yeah. yeah. All right, well, if you had any advice for a new player that wants to take the game seriously and be competitive, what would you give them? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, a little bit want to touch on earlier, play against yourself might seem silly, but you might be able to figure out where you're making these mistakes. Um, obviously, there's so many free resources out there at the moment. I guess essentially access as much as you want. You can watch top players play, ask questions. Like often people will want to just talk about Pokemon. If you think that getting like actual one-on-one -on -one coaching is something for you, then I think it's very beneficial, at least in an um, amount that's suitable for you. But I think that 
playing against yourself is probably the way that I improved when I was younger, and I think it's probably the best thing you can do. I've taken quite a bit of your time, and I'm extremely, extremely appreciative of it because I yeah. know tomorrow is a massive tournament, so All good. I reckon you're pretty chilled. <laughs> For someone who's about to go and compete tomorrow, um, yeah. I'll try and borrow a little bit of that confidence if I can. <laughs> <laughs> See how you go, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Thank you so much, Henry. No worries. It was, it was awesome to catch up with you. You guys got to hear me prattle on for a while. <laughs>